Good morning. I'm sorry I cannot be with you this morning, uh, but uh, COVID decided to share the Thanksgiving holidays with me. So uh, unfortunately, I cannot be there this morning, but I'm looking forward to being back with you in full next week. Uh, so the sermon will be a little bit different this morning, obviously, but that's okay. Um, uh, this Advent, our sermon series will actually be a little bit different as well. Each of the four Sundays during Advent this year, we're going to be focusing on the book of Isaiah, which will be a little different approach for us during the Advent season. We normally look at the New Testament passages and the Christmas story, but this year we're going to be spending Christmas with Isaiah. So I hope you're looking forward to that. And each, each Sunday we'll be looking at a different passage from the prophet Isaiah. There is some debate about exactly when Isaiah lived, but certainly he lived at least five to six centuries before the time of Jesus. So if you think that he lived some five to 600 years or more before the time of Jesus, it might seem a little strange that we're gonna focus on his life and ministry, or at least his words uh, during this Christmas season. But even though Isaiah lived so long before the time of Jesus, he knew and he prophesied about the coming Christ. So Isaiah actually has so much to say to us about Jesus, and we will certainly learn from him as we go through this Advent season at this year. Our theme this morning for the first Sunday of Advent is the normal traditional theme of hope. And our scripture reading this morning from the book of Isaiah certainly speaks to us about this theme of hope. So listen to these familiar words from the prophet Isaiah this morning and, and think about this theme and the meaning of hope this morning. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 through 31. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. In his understanding, no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. May God bless the reading of this word this morning. It's important for us to remember today as we hear these words that the people of Isaiah's time, they were struggling. They were having a difficult time. Hope seemed far away for, for them. Life was difficult, it was tense, life was a daily struggle. God seemed to be distant for the people and, and God's plan and purpose for the world seemed to be a long forgotten dream. Food was scarce for many of the people. Financial resources were being drained on a daily basis. Tensions were increasing. War was a constant threat for the people of Isaiah's time. We could say this morning there were many similarities to the people living in Isaiah's time with our lives today. But it was in this context that Isaiah, the prophet, he was bent on supplying the people with a desperately needed word of hope. So Isaiah writes, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. The long grim years of captivity for Israel, they were just coming off of this, still, still wrapped up in all that that was for them. And they had a bit, that had been physically and mentally exhausting for them. But there was also a spiritual fatigue and this spiritual fatigue was pervasive among the people. But but notice the prophet Isaiah, the, the prophet does not scold the people 
um, for their spiritual malaise. He does not exhort them to just rouse themselves and from their defeatist attitude. Isaiah does not say to the people, well, well, we'll just get over it, right? He doesn't say or do any of that. No, instead, Isaiah proclaims a fresh new word of hope. He reminds the people of the untiring and resourceful God whom they worship. He reminds the people of the boundless energies of God. And, and he says, even though we grow tired and weary, even though we succumb to fatigue, God does not. God does not become tired. God is boundless, positive energy working for good in this world. You know, as I think about that, it, it occurs to me uh, the frustrations that we all live with, uh, the frustrations of our daily lives, they age us, don't they? Our worries, our concerns, they, they, they age us, whether we are young or old, uh, like the Jewish people in a, of Isaiah's time, we get caught up in, we get imprisoned by the barriers that keep us away from hope or keep hope away from us. And these barriers often seem to be incapable of being overcome. But Isaiah reminds us, Isaiah says, God does not faint or grow weary. God's understanding is unsearchable. You see, Isaiah wants to keep before us, Isaiah wants to constantly keep on our minds the belief that God does not buy into or give into the frustrations or the circumstances of this world. Think about that. God does not buy into the things that frustrate us, the things that become weary and tiresome to us. God does not give into the circumstances of this world. In other words, God is not up in heaven saying, I give up. This world is not what I thought it would be. This world is not what I want it to be. These people will never become what I want them to be. That is not our God. Isaiah says, God does not grow weary. God does not give in to the frustrations of this world. God's awareness of a hopeful future, God's continual and patient work toward the good that is yet to come means that we have faith, we have trust in God's patient, hopeful energy that moves us forward constantly to God's promising future. We are different than that, aren't we? Unlike God, we do grow weary. We do get frustrated. We do struggle with despair. Just this past week in our ministerial staff meeting, we were talking about the rising exorbitant levels of depression, fatigue, even suicidal ideation in our world today. The, the growing numbers are frightening. These issues are impacting families everywhere in our community. And these in, in issues are impacting all of us in one way or another. This morning, I, I asked, do, do you know what it feels like to be hopeless? Do you know what that feels like? Do you know what it feels like? to feel tired and drained, to be uncertain about the future, to be uncertain about this world and where it's going, um, not knowing what is possible for this world, for our society, for life as we know it. Is it possible for it to be saved? Is it possible for good to come from it? I think we all struggle with these questions and these issues at times. The events and circumstances of our world today, they often leave us feeling that there is such little hope today. But again, Isaiah says something so different. Listen again to his words. They who wait for the Lord will renew their strength. 
They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not be faint. That doesn't sound hopeless, does it? It sounds energetic. It sounds exciting. It sounds alive. It sounds full of positivity and especially hope. This Advent season is a time of waiting. In fact, that's what Advent means. It's the word is from the Latin Advent and literally means to expect an arrival. It means to wait for that which is to come. So here's what Isaiah wants us to know. Isaiah is saying to wait on the Lord is in complete contrast with watching and being caught up with current events. Let me say that again. Isaiah is saying to wait on the Lord is the exact opposite of being obsessed with, overcome with, burdened by the circumstances and the events of the world around us. In Isaiah's day, the world was rocking and shaking with fear under the campaigns and powers of Babylon. The people kept asking themselves, what's going to happen next? What, what's the next thing that's going to happen in our world? Uh, what next news story will shake and rattle us? What is next? And, and Isaiah wants to say to the people, listen, I'll tell you what's next. The living God. The living God is next. Isaiah says, listen, God's promising future is not based on the next news story. God's hopeful future is not contingent upon what is happening in this world. For us today, that means that God's promising future, it's not connected to the price of gas. God's promising future is not associated with rising inflation. God's hopeful future is not connected whatsoever with empty short, uh, shelves and stores. It's not connected to possible war with Russia in our world today. Uh, the world has dim spots and the world has bright spots. It has difficult times and high times, but even the high times are not able to permanently lift our spirits. Our hope is not based or contingent upon the events or happenings of this world. No, Isaiah says, those who wait upon the Lord discover that occurrences are not the basis of our hope. Waiting for the Lord provided Israel with a core belief and a hope that made Israel a waiting community. That's who Israel was. They were a waiting community, waiting on the Lord. In fact, that's what the early Christian church was. The early Christian church as well possessed that same kind of mentality. There is always hope. Even when the world seems dark and gloomy, even when hope seems so far away. <clears throat> Earlier this week, I read a, a gripping story of a boy who fell through ice. The setting was late December 1968 in a wooded neighborhood in rural Oklahoma. Mike was eight years old at the time, and he and his good friend Dave, who was also eight years old, headed out into the woods to try out a new set of walkie-talkies that had been under the Christmas tree for them that year. As Mike and Dave had wandered out into the woods, they, they came across a pond that had recently frozen over, and Dave, who admittedly was a bit of a wild child, began to venture out onto the ice. Well, Notice that even though the edges of the pond were a radiant bright white in color, the center of the pond was a bit darker. Mike thought to himself, I don't think that ice is thick enough to hold Dave out in the middle of the pond. But just about that time, he saw that the ice began to move in a waterbed wave-like motion as Dave progressed out onto the water. And that's when it happened. Dave plunged into the icy waters. 
for a split second, he was gone. And then suddenly, he, with a gasp, he surfaced once again. Frantically, Dave was reaching toward Mike, who was near the bank. But each time Dave tried to get his upper body out onto the ice, the ice continued to crack and break, and he would go back into the water, preventing Dave from escaping this horrible situation. And no matter how hard Dave tried, he could not rescue himself. As Dave struggled, Mike knew that if he jumped in to try to save his friend, then they both would drown. And as they told the story, all hope seemed lost. The situation was frightening and alarming. But that's when hope happened. Mike, quickly thinking, grabbed a long tree branch that was nearby, spread his eight-year-old body out onto the ice and stretched as far as he could possibly stretch with the branch, hoping it would reach. Both boys struggled. Both boys reached and stretched as far as they could. And finally, finally working together, Dave was able to grasp onto the branch and Mike was able to pull him safely to the shore. It's a simple story, but a reminder of just how frightening, just how dismal life can often feel to us, how the future can often feel so uncertain to us. And in these years, as we try to overcome a worldwide pandemic, uncertain economic difficulties, ongoing fears about war, we need to remember that our God is a God of hope, even in the darkest of times. The inspiration for hope, Isaiah says, comes from waiting for the Lord. That's our inspiration. Believing in God's goodness and in God's promising future, even when we can't see it. The everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, Isaiah says, that is the God who comes to those who wait, those who believe in the seemingly commonplace and routine happenings where God provides hope. Our sufficiency is from God. Anya Silver was a poet and a professor of English at Mercer University. On a personal note, Anya Silver was one of the professors my daughter Jenna had when she was at Mercer. At the age of 35, Anya Silver, when she was pregnant with her first child, was also diagnosed with a rare and lethal form of breast cancer. Anya vi valiantly struggled against the disease and, and also against her waning hope. And as she did so, Anya Silver preached a sermon one day in the chapel at Mercer University. Her sermon was entitled, From Greatest Darkness, Greatest Light, The Blessing of Cancer. Listen to just a few words Anya Silver shared in that powerful sermon. She preached, Shortly after I was diagnosed with cancer, I attended church for the first time in a long time. Although I had hoped to find the experience of worship reassuring and healing, I found myself feeling alienated from the triumphant vision of Christ and God presented in the service. Rather than feeling my confidence in my faith, I felt distant from the other worshipers and from the service itself. I felt surely unfair considering the universality of suffering that cancer set me apart from the rest of the congregation. Finally, I felt I was on the verge of tears and I escaped from the sanctuary to the bathroom where trying to control my increasing tears, I prayed, God, please comfort me. And there, crouched in the bathroom, I felt God's presence come to me in a way that I didn't feel in the service. It was when I was broken down and couldn't even formulate a formal prayer that I felt God's presence. I knew then that God is present in my illness, not outside it, and that I am more open to God's role in my life now that I feel broken 
than I did when I felt whole. Isaiah says, They who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary, walk and not be faint. In his book entitled, A Faith Worth Believing, Tom Stella writes, Hopeful people are undaunted in the midst of adversity, not because they believe things will turn out for the best, but because they are convinced that here and now, life is happening as it ought to, by the dictates and the presence of a wisdom from God that is pure goodness. When we pray, he says, from the awareness of our communion with God, we are less likely to ask for what we think will make us happy and more likely to pray for the courage to surrender to God's ways, to follow that circuitous path that strips us of our ego and reveals the folly of what we think should take place. This morning, we are reminded as we read Isaiah on this first Sunday of Advent, true hope, true hope requires from each one of us that we give up control of our lives. We let loose of the fallacy that we control things and we allow God to take control. To do that is an action, a task. It's not a feeling. It requires constantly reminding ourselves that in the end, we cannot predict or control our future. We simply trust our God who never grows weary working for good. And when we do that, when we give up our desire for control in life, ironically enough, that's exactly when we renew our strength. That is when, as Isaiah says, we soar on wings like eagles. When we give up trying to control life and we trust God, that's exactly when we run without growing weary. It is when we find ourselves walking with God and never growing faint in our faith. For they who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. Would you join me as we pray? Good and gracious God, we give you thanks this day that on this first Sunday of Advent, you remind us of your word of hope. As we wait during this Advent season, help us to wait with hopeful expectation of your promising and good future. Lead us and guide us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.